Good evening and welcome to the, the second last of the Society's lectures for this, our 222nd year. My name is Colin Miller and I'm on the Council of the Society. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, um, a few housekeeping points. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Lots of thumbs ups, that's always encouraging. Uh, firstly, our next uh, and last lecture uh, on the 30th of March will be uh, P Professor Sean Chan Hard Harding uh, talking on the heart, the exquisite machine, the new science of the heart, and there'll be a short AGM before that, hopefully, a short hopefully. <laughs> so there are no planned fire drills for tonight, so if the alarm goes off, Please make your way calmly to the, the fire exits at the front of the at the front of the building. Um, please silence any uh, devices that make funny bingy tingy noises, phones, etc. As usual, our speaker will talk, and then we will go after a short pause um, into the question and answer session. There'll be roving microphones uh, for your use. Uh, please hold the microphones like this and speak slowly and loudly and try and keep your uh, questions to the point. Uh, after the question and answer session, uh, there'll be an opportunity to have a, a wee refreshment and a chat with your pals in the lobby outside. And now to tonight's speaker, uh, Professor Sarah Cunningham Burley. She is an eminent me medical and family sociologist based in Edinburgh. She's not originally from Scotland, but I think she probably feels that she's pretty well Scottish, having spent most of her academic life here in various uh, parts of, of Scotland. Her work focuses on the social and ethical context of medical technologies, data science, public engagement, and health and disease. She has published on a huge range of subjects. I had a quick look. Big breath in now. Population health, eating disorders, autism, sports medicine, end of life care, decision making, ethics, cancer studies, disability, social exclusion, genetics, mental health, sleep, Edinburgh's landscape, education, homelessness, smoking cessation, the list goes on and on in its range of investigated topics. She currently wears several related hats. At Edinburgh, she's Professor of Medical and Family Sociology. She's the lead for equality, diversity and inclusion, the Dean for Molecular Genetic and Population Health Studies, and the coordinator of the Welcome Supported Center for Society, Science, Self and Society. She has also recently been appointed to the chair of the Nuffield Council for Bioethics. And it's on that area which she's going to be talking tonight. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Sarah Cunningham Burley. So thanks very much, Colin. Um, I'm not sure I actually have done all of that. <laughs> um, but of course, none of us do anything on our own either. So I have had the privilege across my academic career of working with so many different people and also across so many different disciplines. That then pulls you in all sorts of directions. So I kind of feel like I know a little bit about a lot of things. <laughs> um, so, and I'll talk about some of those um, things today. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks everyone for for turning out. It's not too cold, is it now? And the signs of spring. Um, and it's lovely to be in this really stunning building. So thanks for that. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the work of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics and what that means for how we can debate um, uh, ethical issues in relation to developments in biomedical science um, that is impactful um, on us all. So I took on the role of chair of this um, 
organization, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, and I'm really loving it. Um, it's taking me into many, many different areas. I'm really keen that the council engages across the whole of the UK. So I'm delighted to be talking about its work um, here, um, as well as um, at its, its offices in, um, in London. So I, the talk is going to be in kind of two, two halves almost. To start with, uh, talking a little bit about the work of the council and how it's trying to embed ethics um, across a, a po in policy and in other areas, and then talk specifically um, around an area of interest of mine that is also, luckily, an area of interest for the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, which is how we can generate good public debate about issues that are relevant in terms of health and illness um, through a process of public engagement. And I'll talk, some, talk through some examples of that. So it is a kind of talking talk in two halves. I really hope it's interesting, but most of all, I'm really looking forward to your questions um, and the discussion um, afterwards. So I thought I would start just to say a little bit about kind of what, what I think or what bioethics is. Um, so I always am anxious because um, I'm not a philosopher, but actually bioethics isn't really only about philosophy. Um, it's a multidisciplinary um, discipline, if that's possible, multidisciplinary study um, of the moral and ethical questions that arise in terms of the development and use of new medicines, biomedical procedures, the ways in which we might alter plants and animals, and the extent to which these bring benefits or harms. Um, and that definition is from the Berman Institute of Bioethics at John Hopkins in the USA. And these ethical issues are present across multiple domains in our everyday lives and decision-making that we all make in relation to our health and illness and other areas in healthcare, in research, in the wider economy and the political system that frames our research in this field and our healthcare. So ethics then is about identifying, studying, perhaps resolving, um, conflicts among competing values and goals and can help us answer the question, what should we do? It's an uncomfortable question for me as a sociologist because we usually just explore what people do rather than what people should do. So that's a challenge for me personally, but one that I'm really keen to, um, keen to take up as you will hear. So it asks that should question in relation to health related life sciences, right from the kind of discovery research that I'm sure you will have heard about in some of your other talks and you'll hear about in two weeks time through to the translation of that work in ways that impact um, on us, perhaps in the, through, the health, through the healthcare system and in the clinic. But discussion of bioethics and the challenges of ethical issues in relation to biomedical science isn't just a matter for the academy either. These issues play out in the media, in policy, in workplaces, as well as in our regulatory frameworks. So public bioethics, I suggest, aims to extend those debates and dialogues in ways that are inclusive and participatory. So that's something the Nuffield Council on Bioethics um, tries to do. Oops. So we work to place ethics at the center of decisions about bioscience, biomedical science and health so that we can all benefit. The council um, was established in 1991 um, to help meet the ethical challenges that were posed by developments in biomedicine and health. And since 1994, we've been funded by the Nuffield Foundation, which is an educational charity, um, the Welcome and the Medical Research Council. And we're unique in Europe in that we're the only national ethics council that isn't state sponsored. So across most European countries, there are these bodies that are funded by government. So that independence from government, I think, puts us in a very 
good but somewhat unique position in terms of how we can critically engage with issues that government should be thinking about as it is proposing or developing legislation or regulation or policy in these areas of matters of health and illness. Um, we work with a kind of five-year strategic plan, which I'm going to talk, talk about now a little bit, because um, we have just launched our new five-year strategy. And that has been um, caused us to kind of reflect on the kind of work that we have done in the past and the kind of work we want to do in the future in order to shape public bioethics. So in our 30 or more years of existence, we've published 36 major reports and they've spanned a wide range of issues from the environment, public health, new genetic technologies, reproduction, just to name a few. And all of our inquiries are multidisciplinary, use multiple methods, and the council has a reputation for bringing together divergent views and carving out practical policy solutions. So there's a kind of normative thrust to what we're doing, as you'd expect in the bioethics space. And we also convene and brief on emerging issues, trying to lay out up-to-date evidence. So it's a great resource um, for those working in related fields who want to attend to ethical issues. And we aim to influence public and policy discourse in two different ways. So one is to have both instrumental impact and what we call conceptual impact. So in terms of influential in, in, instrumental impact, we want to influence the development of policy, law and practice. Um, and the conceptual impact is to develop ways that we can enhance our understanding of the issues, shape and reframe debates, maybe ask different sorts of questions um, as we start to grapple with emergent issues in relation to new medical technologies. And both are still important for us, but we're increasingly concerned to try and deepen and amplify the ways in which we can work in order to influence public debate and, and the policy space. So in a sense, we've become more focused on that instrumental impact um, and focusing on policymaking in discrete areas. But the dual focus remains important um, because in order to have that impact on policy, law and practice, we have to build the foundation of that in-depth conceptual work um, to reflect shifting values, contemporary moral challenges, new methodologies of engagement and deliberation. So ethical analysis is fundamentally discursive. And so bringing position, different positions together is absolutely key to the way in which we work. But there's numerous constraints, um, as one would expect, in terms of trying to embed ethics in the thinking of those who are active in the field of biomedical science and those who seek to regulate um, that work. So the external context um, proposes a number of challenges. First of all, the COVID-19 pandemic really shone a light on the way in which ethics is currently used or rather not used in decision-making because there was largely a lack of ethical preparedness um, from government um, in, as it dealt with and responded to the pandemic. And the language of ethics largely failed to get much political salience during the pandemic. I'll go on later to talk about an example of public engagement um, that focused on those issues um, and and resulted in a call from the public to have greater transparency around these issues in any future pandemic that we may experience. Um, and the second area where we want to see more discussion um, is more discussion and utilization of the tools that ethics can offer to government's science agenda. There's great political interest across the UK um, of Britain being a scientific superpower, um, including the devolved nations, um, but there's generally 
seems to be a low interest in ethics as an allied or integrated discipline in that endeavor. It may change as governments change, um, but in the meantime, ethics is seen by some as a barrier to progress, something, a barrier to be overcome, um, so in order that work can proceed. So I think we have a way to go and before we have a public bioethics. But there's numerous opportunities, um, and some of these are I've already mentioned. So the value of ethics and the independence um, that a body such as the Nuffield Council on Bioethics has can help in brokering really controversial deba debates. Um, eth ethics may not have penetrated the wider discourse around science and technology, um, but the ethical analysis that the Nuffield Council has done in um, recently and in the past has proved very influential in specific contexts. So we have a challenge to balance balance the specific with the to, with the general orientation towards ethics. Um, so our work has tended to um, be most impactful where there's particularly knotty issues engaging with conflicting voices and values and issues that are difficult to resolve. Um, there's some examples of this. Um, we, as an independent ethics expert, we've been were called upon um, by the UK government um, to undertake an independent review of the disagreements in the care of critically ill children. So that these disagreements play out in the media, as we will all be aware, deeply distressing for all parties involved. Um, and we did an in-depth piece of work recently that involved surveys, interviews, <coughs> desk-based work, very inclusive. Um, and the report was laid before Parliament. And the recommendations from that report, I think, are being taken up um, with a task force to oversee the recommendations that we're making to improve, um, it, to improve the practice in relation to resolving disagreements in that space. Another example is that work that we did on genome editing of farmed animals. Um, uh, so the debates around precision um, breeding, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. So the work that we did was directly influential on um, the precision, uh, the genetic technology uh, precision breeding bill, now ACT, I think, um, that because of our work, put animal welfare at the heart of, of some of that legislation. And we're also very involved in ongoing work in relation to genomics and to try and embed ethics at all levels of the strategy in relation to developing genomic medicine. So there are multiple opportunities to, for us all to work together, I think, to collectively shape a biomedicine that is ethically robust um, and one that will serve the needs of the population without um, stymieing um, scientific progress. So the Nuffield Council on Bioethics strategic goals are to kind of anticipate scientific developments and health trends. So you really want to kind of bring ethics to the fore at the very beginning of developments rather than have it as an add-on at the end. That's really important. To undertake and communicate rigorous ethical analysis, but also to do that in multiple formats now so that this is accessible across a wide range of audiences demonstrate the value of ethics for those different audiences and build greater connections in order that we can embed ethics at every sort of level of every level of society. Just small goals, I think um, we would describe those as. We can't tackle everything. Um, so we have identified priority areas in the work that we're going to do. 
um, we conducted horizon scanning um, in order to identify these key areas. Um, I think they're ones that probably everyone in the room would agree are really important in terms of developments in biomedical science and the ways in which they will impact um, us as humans, the wider system of animals and plants um, as well. So the first of those is reproduction, <coughs> excuse me, parenthood and families. Everyone can still hear fine, can they? Yep, good. So the advancement of scientific technologies and the review of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act is likely to ignite intense discussions as the act did when it first uh, came into play. And developments such as embryo models, as well as our ability to culture embryos for longer in vitro are likely to reopen debates um, around the ethical questions around the status of the embryo and what counts as an embryo and what counts as a human embryo. So clearly important developments there. The mind and, and the brain research in that area is accelerating at pace, including the ability to alter brain activity, enhance cognitive functioning, create neural organoids which model parts of the brain. So these developments raise new regulatory issues and ethical questions around agency, consent, and identity, what it means to be human. <clears throat> so we would want to bring together multidisciplinary expertise in that space to navigate these new ethical questions and offer practical policy solutions. A very new area for the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, um, but a really pressing one is in relation to the environment and health. So we know ethical questions surrounding the environment and health are set to intensify. 2023, as we all know, was the warmest year on record. And there are detrimental impacts on physical and mental health that are already well documented. The NHS has net zero targets that are fast approaching. Adaptive and mitigation strategies are needed um, and they need to be adopted at pace. But evolving research and emerging technologies themselves are likely to have environmental impacts that need balancing. So consideration of all of these can be very complex and require trade-offs to, to be made. And we want to bring some bioethical analysis into that space to join with the excellent work that is already done in environmental ethics and focus particularly on what all this means for health. So how do we work collectively then to address bioethics challenges? By we, I mean all of us, society, not the Nuffield Council on bioethics um, on its own. One way that I want to focus on now is through public engagement as a way to generate um, wider and more inclusive debate about these issues. Um, so I will move on to do that now, provide a bit of background around public engagement and then talk through a few examples of work that the Nuffield Council on Bioethics has done in recent years, some of which I've been directly involved in. And excuse me, I just need to cough. <laughs> Maybe get a sip of water. So engaging publics for a, for a public bioethics, I think is absolutely key for us as a society and for those that are engaged in developing biomedical um, technologies. And, and those that are engaged in regulating them. In the UK, we've seen what some have characterized as the participatory turn in science and society. Concerns have been expressed that science has been losing the trust of the wider public, concerns exacerbated during COVID in some ways, um, and engaging the public, especially to improve their knowledge about science is seen as a way of generating trust. Yet scholars, particularly from science and technology studies have questioned not only the assumption that there's been a loss of trust, but also questioned that the solution is one of overcoming a deficit in public knowledge. Instead, 
There's been a lot of research in science and technology studies and some of my own work um, that shows that the wider public, publics, um, are seen, are well able to contribute to discussions about issues that affect them, discussions about science, um, their impact on their lives and on society, whether or not they have specific technical scientific expertise, which we can't all have, and certainly not across all areas of science. So there's been a move away from this deficit model of public understanding, as if everyone in the room is sitting there waiting to be filled up with knowledge, to one um, that is much more a, a, a version of public understanding that involves a two-way dialogue, which hopefully we'll have a little bit of later on this evening, um, as a way of really being much more participatory in terms of thinking through the issues that science raises. There are multiple reasons why we need to do this. Um, partly the pace of change, big data, data sharing, AI, digital health has all brought additional focus on engaging publics to ensure that there is a social license um, that enables biomedical and related research to continue. And that's an area that I have been particularly interested in in my own work. Own work. So there's matters of trust and social license. And then public participation and public engagement has become increasingly embedded in the process of doing healthcare research and in related policy. Some of you may be involved in public panels and other ways um, to become engaged in how research is governed. So why might we engage with the public. Often we use the word publics to imply that the publics are very diverse, not a homogenous, not a, not a, not a homogenous mass. Um, three different rationales have been identified in the literature. First of all, a normative rationale, so the idea that this is a, just the right thing to do. Um, and I, I think it is the right thing to do. Um, it can be generative of all sorts of knowledge that we might not um, attract in or might not be able to identify in other ways. Um, and a process of engagement can bring insights um, that well beyond um, what a researcher or desk-based research might do. There might be an instrumental reason for engaging as well. Um, it might be a means to a particular end. It might be to garner public support or community support for an intervention or for a piece of research that is being done. Um, and a substantive rationale would be one that speaks to the much wider benefits that participation can have, um, perhaps changing the relationship between biomedical science and the publics that it serves. So public engagement does mean different things to different people. Um, and sometimes we need to be very clear as to why we're engaging and what the results of that engagement might mean. And these rationales can in some ways help us to do that, but they're not mutually exclusive, um, of course. And why do we think that public engagement is relevant um, in, in bioethics in particular? So one the pace and impact of biomedical technologies is accelerating, as we will all know. So making ethics matter in that space, I think, is something that we all have some responsibility for if we're enabled to participate in those debates. Public engagement can in help us, can enhance our understanding of issues, um, including disagreements. It can also really extend notions of expertise. So for example, those with direct experience of ill health, for example, um, may bring something to the table that is very different. Um, but biomedicine affects us all. So the expertise that you come of being a citizen, being part of society is highly relevant to the discussions that we have to have around bioethics. 
I think extending expertise to include a wider range of people can really help navigate complexity in policy and in everyday decision making. And this can support good governance towards desirable end points. Public engagement can help identify what are key values or core values, how widely they are held, is there consensus or not around some of the key issues, can help with making decisions about balancing different values and can contribute to the process of governance, not just as a one-off, but as a part of an iterative process of engagement. There are many different approaches to public engagement, and I've used all of these in one way or another at different points. Um, so one, these have been characterized um, in the literature on public engagement. Um, and there is a sense in most of the literature that there's a hierarchy to these different forms of engagement um, with the top of the hierarchy being engagement that is truly participatory, that is quite empowering, um, where there is a shared power and the engagement process can be directly influential. That um, doesn't always happen. And then <clears throat> at the bottom of the hierarchy um, is simply the exchange of knowledge um, and awareness raising of the issues under discussion. That information dissemination and awareness raising is very often a one-way process, like a lecture, um, but we are going to have Q&A, so we will be moving up the hierarchy here. Um, the consultation um, component can be a really useful for getting insights into public views, attitudes and knowledge, and can be a one-way or two-way process. And the empowerment um, level is a two-way dialogue always, working in partnership and working on things that are highly relevant to the communities that you're engaging with. Of course, you generally will need all of these. So I've been involved in quite a lot of public engagement exercises. You absolutely have to provide information. You provide people with the tools for critical analysis to discuss, discuss those issues, which is why um, we've used these overlapping circles as a way to um, conceptualize what public engagement is, um, as well as what it can do. So it's time now just to talk through a few examples of um, where public in, of the public engagement work that we have done at the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, which I hope you'll be interested in. The topics um, I think are really interesting. So the first of these was a public dialogue that we did um, focusing on pandemic um, ethics in 2021, so just as we were emerging from second lockdown. Um, so we were very keen um, to take a deliberative approach um, to this issue of how government responded to the pandemic and what we could do in terms of being prepared for any future threats such as that. Um, so we wanted to develop public debate and embed ethical thinking so that this could be at the core of future pandemics, because as I said at the start, COVID, throughout COVID-19, at least in the policy space, ethics did not loom large as a support, a way in which could support some of the difficult decisions that had to be, had to be made. So we ran workshops, online workshops, um, with a company called Hopkins Van Mill, who did the, did the work with, uh, with us uh, for a small number of participants, because you're gonna have very, very in-depth discussion. Um, they also had access to online material in between the workshops, could provide comments, kind of having an ongoing dialogue in a sense, um, and to discuss a range of issues in relation to the, their experience of the pandemic and their experience of the interventions um, around the pandemic. And they came up with some really societal level issues here. 
and we're very able to move beyond their individual experience to discuss these. And absolutely fundamental to these were the need to heal social divisions, to build trust in government policies and actions, um, to address poverty, disparities in healthcare. So these were the fundamental issues that they were concerned about. Um, ensuring that individual and collective concerns were not in conflict and proposed that the way of doing that was to address issues of fairness, but also to use the core values of kindness, empathy, respect, solidarity, and tolerance. So their direct experience of, of living through the pandemic was that these social divisions had become more stark and wanted something to be done about that. Participants also wanted more trust and transparency to be built into government policies and actions um, and much more to be done to counteract misinformation that we all know was a serious problem um, through the pandemic. There was also a lot of very good information as well, I should say, um, from numerous people that were very active in communicating well. And participants also wanted meaningful public involvement to be built into policymaking in order to build a society that is resilient in the face of future pandemics. So that's a challenge because an ongoing process of public engagement is timely, is costly, needs to be embedded in some kind of government strategy um, for or, in order for that to be achieved. Um, but the challenges of pandemic preparedness um, extend, extend well beyond that as well. So second example is work that the Nuffield Council on Bioethics did around genome editing in farmed animals. Um, so in partnership with the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, we engaged in a program of work exploring ethical issues in genome editing and farmed animal breeding. And there are clearly important ethical concerns in this area of innovation and significant expectations have been placed um, by industry and governments on innovation in agricultural biotechnologies, not least to help solve the multiple challenges of food production um, and its environmental impact. So as part of the work that we did, we wanted to explore public views and values in this area um, as any innovation in this form of biotechnology should be guided by a coherent vision of the future food and farming system. And publics clearly have a significant stake in what that should be. So we thought this could help embed bioscience in society in ways that are guided by social values and are responsive, responsive to societal priorities. So dialogues can create an opening for the public voice into discussions about policy and governance for research and innovation in this area, and an area that people aren't necessarily discussing or not, don't necessarily know a lot about. Um, so participants expressed concerns, again, often took a broad view, um, expressed concerns about animal welfare, and the wider impacts of livestock farming and aquaculture on animals and the environment. They thought that um, justice and fairness, fair access to animal products locally and globally was really important um, to be considered as an ethical issue. Um, and against a backdrop of concerns, um, people questioned which people would benefit from biotechnology and which, which people, which animals would benefit from biotechnology and who and which animals would not. And, and as I said, very important for them about how animals would fare. Um, genome editing of farm animals was seen as having potential if it led to benefits and if it could address environmental challenges, especially in low and middle income countries but it wasn't seen as appropriate solely to increase productivity or for consumer benefits. That was considered to be a, to be a risk. And the sense was that it often would be much better to change the system, change the farming system um, and other systems rather than change the animal. 
but they weren't against all aspects of genome editing, but just wanted to be sure that these that the benefits were very precisely defined and limited, um, so that the, so that precision breeding was not going to be overused. We also found that participation in these dialogues led to a kind of personal awakening of interest for many in these in this area. They thought that regulation should be used to promote the public good, not just to protect the public from harm. And they wanted, again, as with the other dialogues, more transparency, more positive policy interventions in the food and farming system, and also the promoting of alternatives that didn't necessarily priv privilege novel technological solutions. And as I said, this work has been impactful um, in terms of um, shaping some legislation. Now, my last example um, is a public dialogue on the future of aging, another major piece of work that the Nuffield Council on Bioethics has been involved with. Um, we wanted to look at ethical issues in relation to biomedical research and technological innovation to support living well in old age. And so we commissioned a deliberative dialogue, public dialogue as part of that work in order to ensure that any policy changes that we were um, recommending um, were inclusive of public views and values. So again, a small, um, a small group of, of the, the public, wider public attended interactive workshops and included a discussion of our draft recommendations. <coughs> and the participants highlighted four principles to inform the research and innovation process in relation to aging. Um, fairness, including access to products and treatments, um, informed choice and consent, including transparency, accountability for those involved in research, including protection for participants, and safety regulations needed to be in place to ensure the safety of medicines and treatments or technological interventions for end users. But the whole discussion really focused on the need for a holistic approach to living well in older age, the importance of engaging um, with people, not just older people um, in relation to this dialogue, um, of feeling listened to, of working across generations, so the need to take an intergenerational perspective, um, and the again, the importance of equitable access and fair distribution of any technologies that are developed and then moved into implementation. I've got one more example. I don't know if you want to, want to hear it or not, and then I'm just going to conclude. So... Um, it's also another interesting one, but it's an ongoing piece of work, so we'll just tell you about it. Um, so we're conducting now public engagement in England on assisted dying. <coughs> now, this uh, the topic of assisted dying induces a wide range of perspectives across different individuals and groups, and including some very strongly held views. Um, in Scotland, there are proposals to introduce um, legislation for assisted dying through a private member's bill. There is no such movement happening in England um, at the moment. So we want to reach a nuanced understanding of what underpins people's views and how publics can deliberate um, across different views, thinking this will help inform decision making. The Nuffield Council on Bioethics has commissioned this work, but will not itself come to a position on assisted dying. That's not the point of doing this, but we want to see what a group of publics, what a group of the public would think and what kind of position they may come to. So we're acting as an enabler of a deeper conversation about a controversial topic um, that involves different values um, as publics consider the pros and cons of permitting or not assisted dying. So that's, sorry, that's what we're doing. So what we're doing is a nationally representative survey to start with. So that's a, that's a, um, a kind of information type of engagement. 
and then a citizen's jury, which I'll say a little bit more about, and then a second sample where we can take the findings of the jury back out to a much, much wider population. The citizen's jury brings together a small group of people. I think, again, it's 24. Um, I'll come on to that bit in a minute, um, to address specific top, uh, specific questions, not just one question in this case, but the question that they, the questions that they have been given to deliberate on, and we're just recruiting into the jury now, is should the law in England be changed to permit assisted dying? What are the most important reasons against permitting assisted dying? So we wanted to make sure there was a balance to those questions. And then, depending on the answers to those questions, if the law is changed to permit assisted dying in England, what should it include? What should it exclude? If the law is not changed to permit assisted dying in England, are there any recommendations or changes to policy that should be made? So we hope that this dialogue will bring about a deeper understanding of the social, ethical and practical issues from multiple perspectives, an ascertainment of public views on a key societal debate and a deliberative outcome that will help inform policy as this small group of people will have to grapple with different views, talk with each other. They will also hear from a wide range of others that have um, either researched in this space, are uh, clinicians or other healthcare professionals practicing in this space, and um, people with different views. Um, and they will also be given the tools, so to speak, of how to critically engage with those different perspectives and reflect also on their own values as they move forward. So a very challenging piece of work, um, and we will publish the findings in due course towards the end of the year. So just to wind up now, as I said right at the beginning, bioethics as a set of practices demands dialogue, contestation and reflection to create solutions to pressing socio-technical issues. I think to create a public bioethics, public engagement has to be a strand in the work um, that the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, other bodies and agencies that are wanting to embed ethics in what they do. It can ensure that developments in biomedicine reflect public interests and values, even where those interests are in competition or conflict, because dialogue can help create resolutions and solutions. So it can help shape responses to developments in ways that are ethically robust and socially acceptable. And public engagement in bioethics can aid examination of the social, political, and economic contexts of biomedical innovation. So elevate issues away from, uh, not, not entirely away from individual concerns, but all the dialogues that I've ever been engaged with, people can move from, their ind from individual issues and individual concerns to taking a much broader frame. And I think that's really important and can aid decision-making around very specific developments that arise that raise particular ethical concerns. And I think those sp specific examples um, demonstrate how one might do that. So thank you very much for listening. You've been very patient and I look forward to your questions. So uh, questions now. Um, got two microphone runners. One here. At the top. Oh. top. And so we'll maybe just start at the bottom. And remember to hold the microphone so that you're, it's, that's right. You know, it is one thing to analyze the problems, but the second thing is what final conclusions that we can come to, come to which is generally acceptable. That is what is of interest. No, it's a good question. Um... I think through the practical work that the Nuffield Council on Bioethics does, that's exactly what we try to do. So you analyze the problem in order to identify solutions. So you do that fundamental work of sizing up the problem, looking at different perspectives, different points of view, um, and then through a process of deliberation, 
such as public engagement, engaging with experts, roundtables, workshops, then identify solutions. Um, and I think when you get a diverse group of people in the room, that's how you find solutions. So it's not necessarily an academic exercise to find solutions, but the academic exercise of bringing some analytical tools into the space of deliberation, I think can be very useful. An example of what of how we might might achieve that. And what are the diverse views on that? And what might be the conclusion? Okay, so give an example of how we might move from discussion, debate, desk-based research to creating solutions. So, well, let's take the gene gene editing of farmed animals as an example. So the, the dialogues, as well as other work that we did with, uh, with those engaged in that field, engaged in the science, would suggest that foregrounding animal welfare is absolutely key to an ethically sensitive development of that science. And you might think, well, of course it is, but we actually had to say it to make it happen. Um, and it wasn't, ne wasn't necessarily part of the legislation in that space. Um, so that would be an example of the work that we have done says actually animal welfare is much, much higher up people's agenda here than we might have thought. Um, so therefore it has to be part and parcel of the shaping of policy. Let's take the assisted dying example. We don't know the outcome of that yet, um, but um, the outcome, both the process of the dialogue, so the process of deliberation and whatever the outcome is, is something that could then be taken forward in a regulatory context, discussed in Parliament by our legislators, and um, to say, well, actually, what if our survey identifies the vast majority do not want a change in legislation, then that would be quite a robust outcome. Um, if, it, if it suggested that we should be thinking about a change in legislation, then that would propel another set of discussions, but they would be going on in, in Parliament as well as elsewhere. Hope that answers your question. There's another couple. Right. Um, one there. Someone put their hand up. Yes. Okay. Oh, Trish. Yeah. Okay. And then the gentleman on the right afterwards. Could you just clarify how you define it? You, you determine your parameters. And you're talking about very controversial subjects, assisted dying, there are things such as abortion, um, demonstrations outside abortion clinics, even the treatment of animals. I mean, there's such a range of opinions there. So how can you guarantee with your very small samples that you are, are, you, are you trying to lead public opinion? Sorry, I've got lots of questions about this. <laughs> lead public opinion or see if there's concern there? No, those are, those are really good points and I'm not sure I'm going to answer them well. Um, so public engagement is only part of what, of what we do. So it, it's one strand. It was something I wanted to emphasize today because I wanted to raise the concept of a public bioethics that is something for us all and of us, of us all. Um, so it would only ever be one, one component, um, but there is increasing use of engagement tools, deliberative tools to help inform decision-making for good governance. Um, so a lot of research, um, would have patient or public panels that help the researchers to be conducting their work in an ethical way, might be raising issues that the researchers haven't thought about. So it isn't that we would take the results of 
a small deliberation with 24 people and say, well, that's representative of the whole of society. But we would be looking to identify what values have, what values have come into that space and how have, they, how, have that, have, how have they shaped the dialogue? Surveys can help us make that more representative um, sometimes if that's what we wish to do, but it's more the process of discussion and deliberation that is then mirrored by other things that we do in terms of expert, um, expert workshops, um, talking to other key stakeholders in the area and by keeping up to date with the range of literatures on a specific topic. So there's all those strands come together. So you're absolutely right. We wouldn't say, well, the public think this, so therefore do that because that's nothing's ever that linear or that straightforward. But we can, we can say when you get a group of people together um, and that they learn and become informed about an issue, they are able to provide a process of, in, of engaged deliberation that is quite informative, um, but not necessarily representative. Although quite a lot of work is done in terms of, build, of inviting a representative group of people into that space. Hope that answers your question. Gentleman with his hands up there. Yeah, I, I could probably continue this as well with the previous example. If you look at Otto Oppenheimer, Robert J. Oppenheimer, and how he developed the atomic bomb in uh, Los Alamos in New Mexico, when you look at his life story, certainly before my lifetime, but he was a tortured soul uh, after he developed the atomic bomb and it was uh, launched on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Uh, and he had that... Um, uh, kind of difficulty with the president at the time, the Americans. Uh, and that was more or less based on ethics, I think, that he was tortured by. But because he was communicating in various circles, Germans, uh, British, Cambridge, and the Americans too, there was difficulty of communication between these nation states. So I'm just wondering about the ethics there in terms of what he developed. And he was also saying not to go beyond to a hydrogen bomb but to stay as a small atomic bomb. So it was an escalation that was happening at that time. And possibly he was tortured by that feeling of ethics, maybe not on a religious foundation, but ethical. I, I mean, I think that example um, really shows that you can never separate scientific discovery from its social and political context. So the development of the, of the, of the bomb would be an example of that. Um, and I think if you kind of embed ethics at the start, you'd be asking those very questions, wouldn't you, right at the very beginning? Um, but you can't, you can't pretend there's not a political context here um, that was the driver for that, for that work, as well as science being a driver for that work. Um, I don't know in terms of developments in biotechnology as opposed to the dual use, I mean, there's a whole other debate around the dual use of technologies, um, but I, I'm not expert enough to talk about that today. Um, but if you're thinking about developments in biotechnology, I think uh, it, there's a greater potential for openness about the process. Um, and so that scientists would, then not be in a position because they will have engage, engaged and there would have been transparency about the process to um, not have to think, I wish I'd never, never, I wish I hadn't created the thing that has caused the destruction that it's caused. Okay. Another one over here. One there, gentleman with his well, actually, this gentleman here first, and then that gentleman. Um, Thank you very much for an enjoyable evening. Uh, when you get round to looking at your examples, I wrote down a very simple fact, and that is that everything would be helped if they told the truth, because I don't think anybody told the truth. And it's, there is a questionable benefit, I would suggest, 
in having a four-nation debate on assisted dying. From the COVID analysis to date, it would appear that each of the four countries applied the rules to suit their political objectives. The SNP to break away, the Welsh to indicate that Labour could do so much better than the Conservatives, the Conservatives in England to show that they could do much better than Labour, and the Northern Irish, they just didn't know what they were doing. Uh, and therefore, if we do have something on assisted dying, please make it national UK, not four nations. Yes, I think it depends what areas of legislation are devolved. But anyway, thank you. That rests my case, doesn't it? The need for the absolute need for transparency, um, but also that the political and transparency about the political context. Um, but there is a political context. We can't do anything about that, but we can debate and discuss it um, more fully and in a more transparent way. Yes, I agree. One more. Up Before up. we go on to, uh, we'll maybe have a question from our oh. audience out there. Uh, on, uh, so. Okay, so one of, one of our online questions. Who chooses your topics for discussion? And is anyone listening to the answers? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes to the second point. Um, so, I, 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 our work is well used. Um, so, you just have to take my word for that at the moment. I'm quite new in the role, um, but uh, we 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 continue to get funding. People, um, policymakers, and others will come to us for ad advice. So, I think all of that suggests that yes, the work is impactful. Sorry, what was the first part of the question now? Who chooses your topic for discussion? Yeah. So uh, uh, there's a combination of, of work that's done. So sometimes we might be asked to focus on something. So a government department or someone else might say, can we partner with you to do some work on a particular area? We also do our own horizon scanning in order to identify upcoming issues. Um, and so we have a team of people that are doing that, doing that work. And then we have a kind of structure of advisory groups around our different themes who then work to get to work together and with wider stakeholders to identify specific topics. So sometimes it might be something that's absolutely coming up um, in terms of potential changes in legislation. So that's happening with the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act. It's under review. It's an area where we've done a lot of work in the past. So of course we will be contributing to that debate. In other areas, it might be something that we want to bring up, um, higher up the agenda in terms of public debate, so we might identify something. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned that you were an independent body, unlike other um, similar bodies in, in the European Union, and that gave you um, uh, an advantage. You've obviously made some difference. You talked about significant impact in the areas of critically ill children and, and animal welfare. And it seemed to me that coming out of many of the areas you went to, people talked about um, fairness and justice, particularly around about health. We've had numerous reports decade after decade after decade talking about health inequalities, and that's a determinants of health. I wondered if you could see as chair of your body at any point where you would move over rather being a more academic body to be more of a political, political to try and change in that way there to reduce those inequalities. Yeah, no, um, they've all been great questions, so thank you. So the Nuffield Council on Bioethics is not an academic body, so that's a kind of switch for me. So I think it provides uh, an opportunity to perhaps shape those debates a little more, but you're absolutely right. You know, for decades and decades of work on inequalities in health, and then suddenly we're surprised that COVID demonstrates that these are really stark. Well, all of us working in that area knew, kind of knew that. Um, but the challenge is a political challenge, isn't it? What to do about it? But I think we can, this is a, maybe you'll think this might be a weak answer and I apologize, but 
partly through the public engagement work where these issues are absolutely to the fore. That is what, you know, it's what people directly experience, lack of access, poor health um, related to socioeconomic um, circumstances. So by raising those as kind of core concerns, um, I think we can maybe help shift the dial in the way that further research doesn't always seem to be able to do. And there's some left up at the back as well. The gentleman here and then the gentleman at the back in the rugby shop. Uh, thank you for such a, a clear explanation of the structure involved in this process. It occurs to me that the more thoroughly done this was, there would be an enormous number of variables involved that all would have to be reconciled. I wonder if there's a role for artificial intelligence in coming to good conclusions about what's involved. No, no. So, well, yeah, we should just chat GPT that question, shouldn't we? And see, see they could uh, see what talk they would come up with. I think, I think you're right in terms of. Um, you know, one could use artificial intelligence to look at you know masses of content in the media. So looking at um, how debates are playing out in the media can be used, excuse me, to analyse very wide ranging consultations um, as well. So, but whether it it can help us identify core values that form part of how we deliberate on complex issues. I'm not sure that, that that's the case yet, if ever. Well, thanks. Thanks for an interesting talk. What, what I was going to try and uh, probe with you is, uh, you gave an example of, uh, of your assisted dying uh, project, but it seems that before you've even started, you've decided that you're not going to make any policies about it. No, yeah. so in that case, we're not. Um, in most of our other work, we would be making recommendations based on what we're doing. I think with this one, we felt it was so controversial and that we had to steer, we should steer a neutral path in that and let the dialogue speak for itself. So that is not usually how we would work. We would normally make policy recommendations. So we're doing this work and then almost kind of like handing it to policy saying here's the work okay you... so that's an unusual an unusual yeah, example yeah, yeah, but but... I can ask one very quick other question and that is that the whole focus of your talk has been on public engagement and uh, the importance of that and how that brings fresh views uh, to bear the when it comes to decision making when on those occasions when you do actually make policy do you have public members on your council making those decisions or do you just consult with, with the uh, the public um so we have yes and no so we have a council that is um has a wide range of people on them some scientists bioethicists some academics but a much broader field of people um that kind of set the strategic direction um are engaged in specific pieces of work sometimes, and then there's a, a kind of secretariat and executive that that do the work. And in doing on those particular topics, they're linked to all those key thematic areas and horizon scanning. And then they do a lot of work engaging more widely, and that will include with um, different public and community groups as appropriate for the for the topic. Um, so, so the there's, there's the a question, kind of yes and yes the, and no answer to that question. Good yeah, question. Because the reason I asked the question was that uh, for local ethical committees, uh, it's been common practice for a number of years to have a lay member who's on the decision-making board of the uh, of the committee. So, so it's, I'm just probing how how far you take public engagement. Do you take it right up to the decision-making process or do you just engage early on? Well, I wouldn't we, ask any more questions. You can ask as many questions as you like. I'll be around for a, I'll be around for a while. Um, so we're not, we don't make decisions. We make recommendations because we're not, a, we're, you know, we're not a, we're not a, we don't, we can't make policy. 
um, we can guide policy, and in that process, we are we are, are try to be as inclusive as possible in who we're engaging with in order to generate the recommendations. Um, and the council has a range of members on it. Some of whom you might can, might say are kind of lay lay members in as much as the expertise that they're bringing might not be related to a specific um, discipline or a specific um, professional position. Lots more questions. Um, there's somebody, a lady up at the back there in red with her hand up. Oh, it's someone up at the very back. Goodness gracious. Okay, right. Hi, um, my question builds on uh, the previous question. Um, just when you're talking about public engagement, I'm interested, uh, as you guys are independent, other, I know you said other organisations within the EU aren't independent, they're kind of government affiliated. How far do they take public engagement? Do they have lay members? Are you much further ahead than they are? Oh, sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I've been in the in the role to, too short too short a time. I've just started to um, kind of build relationships with those other ethics councils. Um, so I don't know. I would think probably yes and yes and no. I expect they have um, as kind of formally constituted government bodies would have a lay member lay members on them. But I don't. I don't know. Sorry, I'll find out. Send me your email. Give me your email, and I can let you know. It's gonna work down. Mm -hmm. Um. So this lady in the red here, and then we'll come down. Work up in the middle again. Um. So has there ever been? Has there ever been a time when your um, your uh, committee has not been able to generate um, the public engagement that wanted or hasn't been able to get the demographics that wanted for a particular study? Um, and if so, how, how would you generally approach that issue if you either were not receiving much public engagement or you weren't receiving public engagement from the demographics you wanted? No, I think I think we work with um, will often commission agencies whose um, expertise is around public engagement, and there's now quite sophisticated mechanisms that can be used to um, recruit people into um, public engagement activities. So, in my in my experience, both with the Nuffield Council's work, but also the work I've done across my career, that hasn't 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 been an issue. We don't all. We don't always. Public engagement doesn't form. We don't do it for absolutely everything that we're. All aspects of our work. So I've picked out those areas um, where we have done that, um, and I'm very keen that it's a, a key part of our work for the reasons that I've um, said this evening in terms of generating a publicly focused um, approach to bioethics. Thank you for a most interesting talk. The, the question relates to the setting of the questions. This, you know, it can, if, if you set the agenda to some extent, you set the outcome. Um, for, and taking the example of the the gene editing farm animals. Now, I, I speak as a carnivore, so I've got no axe to grind on this one, but say out of the initial exploration came the, the idea that why don't we just stop eating them and the problem will go away? Would that be allowed to be part of your discourse? Well, we... Well, we... So one would likely shape the agenda when you go into into a public engage in public engagement dialogue um but we wouldn't would never ask that question because that would really shape the responses but that might be an emergent issue 
people might say, well, why don't we not eat? Why don't we not eat animals as a solution? That wasn't the case. And that, as I understand it, that dialogue had uh, people who did and didn't eat animals in it. Um, and uh, a sense that that was a, that was a personal choice and that one had a right to eat, if, if, if I remember the um, results correctly, that was considered a right to eat animals. So that wasn't, but there was a sense that we should focus on the challenges of food production in ways that are not just reliant on developments in biotechnology. So that could be a number of a number of different things. Uh, thank you. Ethical debates are often highly contested. I'm glad your last slide is still up there showing the concept of contestation. And my question is, um, how can you avoid the temptation to resolve them by uh, regression towards the mean, uh, resulting in the fallacy of the middle? Yes, good question. It depends what you, um, what you think of resolution is. So there are some areas where you're never going to, you, 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 there is never going to be a consensus May, they may not, you're never going to do, sorry, this is very inarticulate, isn't it? Because it was a, a really good question. There might be areas where people's views are never going to shift. They're so deeply held and for multiple reasons, um, but, they, but you might still be able to engage in a creating solutions that allow for the continued presence of those views. Um, so something would not be mandated or mandatory. Conscientious objection, for example, in relation to abortion would be an example of that. So you can create a solution that still allows for diversity in relation to strongly held views. So I think that's the challenge around contestation. There might be areas where you, they, that, even that is not possible. But you can think of controversial issues in relation to the 14-day rule and embryos. You know, lots and lots of debate and discussion here before you could land something that appeared to work. Um, although there'll be some that will always object to the use of human embryos in research, for example. But as a society um, and as, uh, as a, uh, and the legislation enabled and allowed a number of voices to come to play in order, and then to create um, a predominantly socially acceptable solution. It's up for debate again now, so we'll see what, see what happens. But it's not easy, is it? But the process has to be one of, of dialogue and tolerance of difference and then trying to work, um, allowing difference where that's appropriate within the frameworks that you're trying to tr promote through regulation. Yes, is that all right? Yeah. yeah of yes, thanks. Of course. Sorry. Of course. Um, Yes, I just wanted to, um, our talk seems to have been limited to the role of the Nuffield Council on, on bioethics rather than just the general role of bioethics. I mean, it's not, though the work that you do is very, very interesting things, it's not entirely a new discipline. I mean, I seem to remember Mary Warnock chairing a whole committee that took public evidence and things um, before the first legislation was passed about embryo research and things, and there being a pretty wide public debate about it at the time. So what I really want to know is where else is this debate taking place? Um, you know, is it taking place in the Medical Research Council about what they fund? Is it taking place within universities about the kind of research that their staff are doing? Um, 
you know, where else is it taking place? Where can we look to see it and hear it? And what is its quality? And is the Nuffields Councils on Bioethics Research particularly tailored to influencing government legislation? Um, tailored to influencing policy, yeah. Um, but that's not necessarily legislation. So it might be kind of soft, soft law, soft regulation, uh, helping um, agencies to develop frameworks um, uh, and, and all the other work in terms of raising debate and public awareness and providing resources and to embed bioethics. So it's not just, legis not just legislation. You're right, there's lots of other work work going on, you know, um, research ethics uh, committees, um, which will all have lay members on them in universities as well as in um, uh, as well as in health and social care. Um, so, and the funders funders of research likewise will have um, ethics um, uh, ethics strands to what they're doing, both directly funding ethics research. Um, but I think, and some, and some, those funders also fund us. Um, so that's a, a, a kind of a, a, a two-way relationship. So we can support them in their own work around ethics, um, and various government departments and major, you know, major developments in biomedicine will also have kind of ethics committees that will be overseeing some of what some you know, will be overseeing some of the work we work in collaboration with some of those as well to just elevate and enhance the um, enhance what's going on and learn from them as well. So yes, it's definitely not just enough for your council on bioethics, there's tentacles out all over the place to really develop, develop bioethics. The council can be in a position to kind of convene some of that and bring, um, bring some consistency perhaps to those the diverse work that's going on. Hello, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I wondered if there are similar organizations in other countries where they have different systems. For example, the whole debate about abortion in North America um, in other countries, I don't know, to use extreme example, Russia, China, uh, about what in their societies are ethical. But just sticking with America, the death penalty, the um, um, the abortion debate, are there public debates on these that you're aware of? Um, I can't give a very informed answer to that question. We We do liaise with kind of um, institutes of bioethics um, in, the, in the US, I think the challenges of engaging with policy there, especially with, uh, with um, you know, both centralized and federal, um, you know, federated system is, re you know, is really challenging. Um, and I think there's, I can't, I can't answer because I don't know, I don't know in any detail. Um, I think, um, we have just come back from a trip to Beijing, actually, where we were working um, with um, academics that are helping to shape government policy in, in the bioethics space. So there's work developing there, and I'm sure that will be the case in many, uh, many other countries, but I don't know enough about it to answer your question any better than that. But thanks for the question. Is there anyone up at the back? I can't see. No. Okay, the gentleman here. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, my question takes me back to the farming uh, and the view that perhaps is expressed that perhaps bioethics is something that farmers don't think about. I would dispute this because historically, farmers' livings rely upon them breeding the best animals and growing the best crops. My grandfather made a fortune out of breeding Isdale show horses. He sold one which was worth eight Bentleys back in the 30s. And he did it 
properly by looking at what was required to get a good Clydesdale horse. And all farmers that I know of, apart from the ones who go in for chicken breeding and American farming of uh, farmed animals, uh, but respect the lives of their animals and their crops because it's their livelihood. You wouldn't do anything unethical if it affected your livelihood, would no, no, you? No, no, you're absolutely, absolutely right. And I, I hope I didn't imply that. It was more that the leg, the leg, that our work has meant animal welfare features in the legislation around gene editing and animals. Not that farmers didn't have don't have an, their animals' best interests at heart. Of course they do, of course they do because they want them to grow and flourish. And that's what the um, public engagement participants also wanted um, to to. Hello, um, I was previously Director of Public Engagement at the UK Parliament, so a lot of what you're talking about in terms of public engagement is very, very familiar from um, the rationale for why you do it in the first place, the approaches that you use and the benefits that you get from it. Um, Parliaments are now recognising the value of deliberative methods now, particularly in tricky policy areas, like where there's not an obvious answer, like social care, climate change, that sort of thing. But it's very expensive, as I think you mentioned. One of the most difficult questions I used to have in my former role was, um, how do you evaluate the impact of your work? And is it value for money? Do you ever have to justify the, the expense um, and or do you have an evaluation framework that, that lets you prove the impact and answer that sort of question? Uh, um, so we we have funding on a kind of five five year cycle, um, and so there's a limited amount of expensive public engagement we could do with that. But we sometimes get additional funding um, for in key areas. Maybe a government department might want want the work and might support public engagement or another agency might do that. Um, I think it's discussion for another time about how you actually embed this in, in good government and good governance and put and allow the price tag to, you know, to be part and parcel of, in a sense, it's mainstreaming it, isn't it? Um, because um, as, you, as you will know, and I've said, this is, it shouldn't just be one off um, one-off dialogues or one-off engagement you want this kind of constant process and kind of iteration so the kind of scaling up I think is a, something that not, not, not us the Nuffield Council on Bioethics but us as society um, and our government should really be thinking about um, but I'm sure you will have a lot of views about about uh, the kind of opportunities and challenges that that, that, that brings but yes good engagement is, is expensive. Right, um... I think it's nine o'clock. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, your talk was fascinating and uh, thought provoking. Um, I'm sure you've stimulated, well, I know you've stimulated a lot of discussion amongst the audience tonight, and I'm sure that will carry on, which is, I presume, that's your aim in life. Uh, Albert Einstein said that if I'd only known, I'd have been a locksmith. But science isn't really like that. Um, the details and workings of nuclear physics or biology uh, would still have occurred. And um, our responsibility, I suppose, is that uh, to place that knowledge into an ethical framework. And that's what you do. And you've been talking about tonight. Uh, very complex stuff. Our thanks. Um, so, uh, <laughs> 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 great pleasure <laughs> without the microphone.
to um, give you a, a memento <laughs> of, of tonight's talk, uh, the Society Paper Weight. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> but also, thank you, that's lovely. But, but, but also um, the Minerva, the Society's Arts Medal, uh, the Minerva Medal, uh, okay. a, a special talk. Thank you, thank you. That's very kind of you.